Once again, we're getting to what's got to be one of my favorite parts of the week, doing these question shows. So I've got a bunch of your questions that I've pulled out. I'm going to answer them here. But as always, wherever you're watching the video, if it brings a question to mind, or if you just got some question that you've been wondering about, go ahead, type it in any of the videos, and I will find a bunch and do them here. Here we go. Adam Kudelski. We're considering many scenarios in which we contact alien species. Do we consider any of the potential scenarios as a test built to test us on the ground of morality, instincts, or intelligence? This is one of the ideas of the Fermi Paradox, one of the ways to explain the Fermi Paradox, that there is some grand galactic federation and they are not going to let us know of their presence until we have proven ourselves to be worthy. And in fact, that was Star Trek, right? The Federation had the, um, the prime directive where they weren't allowed to mess with the planet until the citizens of that planet had developed space flight and then they could meet the rest of the galaxy. And that idea does make sense to a certain point. You can imagine some highly evolved civilization being very careful about not influencing some less, more, you know, more primitive civilization. But at the same time, whenever I think about these kinds of scenarios, I think, well, the universe or the galaxy is a really big place, and what are the chances that they all would do it? So you might have 5,000 civilizations in the Milky Way, but it only takes one of them to let us know that they're here, and 4,999 to try and keep the secret. So whenever you come up with these ideas to try and explain why we don't see aliens, you've got to ask yourself, would that always be the case in all situations? And if not, if you can imagine a situation where it's not possible, then even though the odds are unlikely, you kind of have to say, well, it doesn't seem like it would work in all situations. So that's my response to that, which is, it's a great idea, we live in some galactic zoo, but I would expect some Captain Kirk to break the rules and come down and, and you know, break the prime directive. Logan Manko. If you could go faster than the speed of light away from the Earth or just our solar system and look back, could we see the Earth millions of years ago? We would have to catch up with the photons emitted millions of years ago to see what it was like back then, or would they have decayed by now? Just a thought. Also, time travel with light speed possible or question mark? As you move out into space, if you could go faster than the speed of light and then turned around and looked back at the sun and looked back at the earth, now assuming that you could build a telescope powerful enough to do it and assuming that you could go faster than the speed of light, then you would totally see the earth in the past. If you traveled out two light years, you would see the earth two years ago. If you traveled out 10,000 light years, you would see the earth 10,000 years ago. And if you went millions, billions of light years away, you would see the earth as it was in the past. Now, could you use this for time travel? No, I mean, you're still, time is still moving forward. You're just seeing the past. You're not actually traveling. And if you tried to travel back to earth, you would see the earth closer and closer and closer to what it is now until you finally got to earth and it would be now again. So it's a great way to be able to see in the past, except that, of course, traveling faster than the speed of light seems to be impossible. And have, you know, we can barely see the surface of Mars from Earth, not to mention millions of light years away. But theoretically, yeah, absolutely. Jack Keenan. Hi, Fraser. I've always struggled with the concept as it seems like a plaster over a gaping problem. Are there any credible alternative theories to the Big Bang? We actually just did a video on this, which is the idea of cosmic inflation, which is literally developed to, f to solve the problems of the Big Bang. Now, when you say it's like plastering over, there are multiple, four, five, six separate lines of evidence that tell us that the universe is expanding away from itself that if you look in all directions, you see galaxies and galaxy clusters moving away from you. And so if I see two things speeding away from me in opposite directions, it makes me feel like maybe in the past those things were together. So the Big Bang is this idea of an expanding universe. And that you could, then, and then you have to assume that if you could, you know, if the universe is expanding and you roll things backwards and you come back down into a time when the universe was very small and hot and dense. But the Big Bang has problems, right? The, that the flatness of the universe is a problem. The, um, the fact that there aren't monopoles in the universe is a problem. Uh, so, so because of these problems, 
astronomers, you know, Alan Guth had to develop this concept of inflation, which now astronomers are looking for. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the Big Bang is wrong. It means that the Big Bang doesn't fully explain the universe that we find ourselves in today, and so you find more. And a great example of that is Newtonian gravity versus, say, Einstein's understanding of relativity and how gravity works, and that it's a warping of space-time, not an attraction of, of objects. There were more uh, alternatives to the Big Bang, but they, they were still like, you know, an oscillating universe where things were sort of moving back and forth kind of like this, or like a steady state universe where, where things are expanding apart but the new material is expanding in between it, but none of those have the kind of evidence that the Big Bang has. So if you have to pick the thing that is most likely, the thing with the most evidence, that's the Big Bang. And next up comes looking for inflation as that next step on top of the Big Bang. Razashor Maharajan. What would happen if the Earth was a few thousand miles near or farther to the Sun from its current position? Would it still be habitable? The Earth actually orbits the Sun at an elliptical path. So, so the Sun is on an average 150 million kilometers away from us. But actually, sometimes at one point at perihelion, it's called, the Earth is 149 million kilometers away from the Sun, and then on the other time of the year, at aphelion, when, this, when the Sun is at its furthest, it's like 153 million kilometers. So, so there is a difference of about 4 million kilometers from when the Earth is at its closest point to its distance point. So you said a few thousand miles, yeah, no problem if the Earth was a few thousand miles. Even on average, it would make no great difference. In fact, this is sort of interesting that the southern hemisphere, when I mean, you think about Antarctica, is much colder than the North Pole and the Northern Hemisphere. And part of that, part of that is because the, most of the, of the southern half of the Earth is ocean, but part of it as well is that the Southern Hemisphere feels more extreme seasons than the Northern Hemisphere does because when the Southern Hemisphere is having its winter, it's at the most distant part of the sun. And when it's having its summer, it's, it's closer. And the, and the Northern Hemisphere is backwards. For us in the Northern Hemisphere, during the middle of winter, the, the Earth is at the closest part of its orbit to the Sun. And in the middle of summer, we're actually further away. And that makes it a tiny little bit milder for the Northern Hemisphere than for the Southern Hemisphere. But yeah, a few thousand miles, no big difference. Millions of kilometers, then we might start having a problem. And eventually you get to Venus, which sucks. Ram Pradeep. Could there be stars that we don't know of which are supermassive enough to fuse iron and further heavier elements in the periodic table? It's not about the mass of the star. There are stars that are hundreds of times, you know, at least a hundred times the mass of the sun and more massive. The problem is the reaction of fusion. When you've got two hydrogen atoms and they mash together and create helium, that reaction is exothermic, which means that it gives off radiation. And as you move up the periodic table of elements, if you put helium together, you get an exothermic reaction. If you put oxygen together, silicon together, neon together, all the way up the periodic table. And the problem is that when you get to iron, you, when you, under great pressure, push iron atoms together, they don't generate any energy. In fact, it takes energy to fuse iron and above. And so there's no amount of mass that would, that would make a star function the way it does, the way a main sequence star does, by fusing those heavier elements. We get all these heavier elements in the universe when those massive stars reach that point of iron. And literally within a fraction of a second, the whole, once that iron core develops, then there's no more energy pushing outward on the star, and the whole thing collapses in on itself at like 70% of the speed of light. And it's that pressure of, the, of these layers coming down into the core that creates the heavier elements. You get all of that fusion. You get gold and, and silver and everything higher than iron in that moment when all those layers are coming down on itself. Ken Wenzel. Don't worry, I'm not an evil genius, but is it possible to hack the ISS? I don't know, but the ISS is run with computers and there's computers at NASA that are managing the functions of ISS. So I would assume that it is 
theoretically possible to hack the ISS and definitely hack the, or not definitely, but theoretically hack the computers on Earth that are communicating with ISS. I mean, they're running various operating systems. I don't know exactly which ones. I think to ever assume that any computer is unhackable is crazy. That if a computer is reachable by the internet in any way, shape, or form, then it is theoretically hackable. Now, it could very well be that the ISS, no computers on it are connected in any way, shape, or form to any other computer in the world, and if so, then, then great. But I would, I would assume that this is a risk that NASA has thought of and prepared by putting in various security measures. I sure would. The secure computer is the one that you enclose in a block of concrete and you dump in the middle of the ocean. That's it. Every other computer is kind of insecure. F Sapo, how will JWST be maintained? We had to go to Hubble to do repairs and upgrades several times since we put in orbit, but it's in LEO, so access was easy compared to where JWST will be. Plus, JWST is massive compared to Hubble, making repairs and upgrades even more difficult. This is one of the big downsides of the James Webb Space Telescope, is that it's going to be at the Earth-Sun L2 Lagrange point, which is you know, more than a million kilometers away from the Earth on the other side, you know, of, of the Earth from the Sun. We can't reach it. So the launch has to go perfectly. The deployment, the origami deployment of its huge mirror, its sunshade, all these things have to go perfectly the first time, the only time, and if it doesn't, there's no way to fix it. And this is a big risk. At the same time, it's the right place for the spacecraft to go. It's the going to be the most powerful, most sensitive telescope that we've put into space so far. So let's really hope that they're very careful. Now you can imagine in the future, maybe there will be some future human mission that will make an attempt and go off to the L2 Lagrange point, but we've never gone that far. We don't have the capabilities to do that. It is a whole other world of complexity and, and NASA is, is, I think they'll write the spacecraft off if it dies. Garen234, can you help us make sense of why the night sky looks as it does at different times of the year? Well, keep in mind that the way the night sky works is that the sun is just another star in the sky of all the stars, it's that the earth is going around the sun. And as the earth is going around the sun, from our perspective, the sun is moving around to the background stars. And this is what the zodiac is, is the place where the sun is. Sometimes it's in Leo, and other times it's in Sagittarius. And each time it moves. And so, really, it's the Earth's motion around the sun that causes this changing perspective of the night sky over the course of the year. If there was no sun, right, if there was no sun at all, then you could, over the course of a 24-hour period, as the Earth turned, see the entire night sky, all the constellations, because we wouldn't be going around the sun and we wouldn't be getting this changing perspective. It's because we have daytime. Like right now, the sun is in the middle of a constellation. I'm not sure which one it is right now. Um, but, and then at other times of the year, because the Earth will be in a new position, everything will have changed. Frank Lisk, does a photon have mass? I've read that it doesn't, but why do black holes pull a weightless radiation? Again, it's important to remember that black holes and all mass, when they exert gravity, they are not pulling, right? They're not grabbing gravity. They are distorting space-time so that straight lines are curved. And just imagine, right, if, if you're a, you know, a, on a fabric and you pull the fabric down, you've got an and you get this sort of curved line. If you drop a ball, the ball's gonna go around and around. The ball thinks it's going in, a, in a, st a straight direction, but actually it's following the curves of this, of the fabric. And that's the same thing that's happening in space. And so it works for planets moving around black holes and it works for photons of light. Photons are just following a straight line, but they are following the curvature of space-time around that's been warped by the black hole. Clash of Team. Hey Fraser, do you think we could somehow make the expansion of the universe slower or make them close together? You're wondering if we could somehow stop the universe from expanding and, the, and from galaxies getting further apart? Uh, that would be tough. Um, we, well, I mean, we don't, one, we don't really kind of know what dark energy is and why it's causing this acceleration of the universe. But I guess in theory, if we could somehow reach 
you know, these other, we, we talked about how to destroy the Milky Way, right? And you would, you could slowly put scat off thrusters around all the stars and crash them all into the supermassive black hole at the middle of the Milky Way. So in theory, you could uh, take, go to other galaxies and, and use the thrust of those galaxies to slowly push them closer together and maybe limit the amount. But in some cases, they are expanding so fast away from each other that you could never bring them back together. Could there be some new physics that we don't understand that would allow us to change space-time itself so that things don't expand? I don't know, maybe, but right now, we've got our limits. Christian Cardenas. I want to know how many years do we have until the sun goes red and we can escape to another galaxy or planet. The sun's been burning for about four and a half billion years and it's going to keep on going for about the same maybe seven billion years until it runs out of fuel in the center, expands as a red giant and gobbles up the inner planets. But that's not the danger to the Earth. The danger to the Earth is the fact that the sun, as it is, is consuming hydrogen in its core and turning into helium, it's actually increasing its temperature by a little bit. And over the course of the next, say, 500 million to a billion years, it's going to get so hot that it's going to render life on Earth over. It's going to be too hot. You're not going to be able to have liquid water on the surface of the Earth anymore. We're going to get heated like Venus. And so we don't, we don't have to wait the seven and a half billion years. We will lose the water on the Earth in like a billion, which is, I know, it's kind of sad and scary. I, we all plan to live a billion years. But, you know, if you were thinking that you had 7 billion years, now you've only got 1 billion years. So whatever plans you are, you're going to want to move them up. Of course, in theory, we will be able to move the Earth to compensate for the heating that's going on from the sun. And if so, then we can slowly move the Earth out as the sun increases in temperature and we'll be fine. We did a whole episode on how to do that. All right. That's it, that's the end of the question show. Thanks to everyone who sent in their questions. I really appreciate it. Now, I'm gonna link you to a playlist of a bunch of cool videos that I've been watching in the last couple of days that I think are worth you watching and some people you should be subscribing to. So give that a check, give that a check out. Check that out. <laughs>